This little piggy helped end the organ black market. And this little piggy helped a baby with hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This little piggy made a pancreas. And this little piggy grew bone. And this little piggy went rogue because it was a genetically enhanced human pig chimera with increased intelligence and it rose up chanting, four legs good, two legs bad. In 1964, down in Jackson, Mississippi, three years before the first successful human heart transplant, James Hardy put a chimp's heart into Boyd Rush. Hardy had already gained fame after performing the world's first human lung transplant, but with no human donor available for this one, and inspired by a colleague's recent success with chimp kidneys, he attempted to save Rush's life with a non-human donor. It failed spectacularly, with Rush dying not an hour later. He never regained consciousness. In fact, he wasn't conscious beforehand. He was in a coma and never consented to the operation, something that simply wouldn't happen today. The consent was gained from his wife, who signed a form which made no mention of the possibility that the heart might not be human. Further attempts were made through the 70s. Sheeps, baboons, chimps, pigs, all cataclysmic failures. I mean, rejection within minutes. You know, like when you slide into somebody's Tinder DMs. In 1984, Leonard Bailey put a baboon heart into newborn baby Faye, which captured the public's imagination and horror. My baboon heart, buddy, rejecting it. <laughs> when asked why he didn't choose the more closely related chimp, Bailey said that he didn't believe in evolution. Faye survived three weeks before dying of rejection. She was blood type O, the most common human blood type, but one that exists in less than 1% of baboons. Xenotransplantation became a taboo subject, it already was in many ways, and spent several decades in the wilderness with seemingly insurmountable obstacles to its success. But earlier this week, in 57-year-old David Bennett received a pig's heart in a world first, and so far, Fingers crossed, reports are good, and we all wish that he continues his recovery and gets many extra years. He was ineligible for the current accepted treatments, human heart transplant or mechanical support, like special pumps that are inserted, so agreed to this last resort. So why is this being hailed as such a huge success in contrast to the previous ones? What are the implications? Could this actually turn out to be better than human organ donation? Will he ever eat pork chops again? Why are we placing all of our cutlets in the piggy basket instead of primates? Does anybody else remember that 90s BBC TV show called Pig Heart Boy? about this exact thing. Is bacon now the cause and the cure for heart disease? Let's take a look at the science of this amazing operation, but also the ethics. I've seen a lot of people uh, commenting online saying, well, if you eat meat, there's no ethical dilemma here. And I get that, but actually xenotransplantation is a lot more complicated than that. Professor Ray has been working for some time with scientists who breed special pigs with organs suitable for transplant into other species. Doctors have been using bits of pigs in medicine for years. Arnold Schwarzenegger has a pig's heart valve in his body. And Cam, Professor Ray is prepared to consider you for a pig's heart transplant. Well, this would be the first xenotransplant involving a human patient. Xeno what? Xenotransplantation is cross-species transplantation. A few years ago, I attended a special anniversary event at the London Science Museum celebrating 50 years since Christian Barnard's first heart transplant in 1967 and heard an amazing talk uh, about xenotransplantation from one of the leaders in the field. And that's where I learnt that Norm Shumway, who is regarded as the father of heart transplantation, said xenotransplantation is the future of medicine and it always will be. For many years there was that justified scepticism because we simply didn't have the biological capability to make it work. But it really feels like that is changing now due to recent developments in genetic engineering. So what's the need? Well, I'm sure you already know this, but I'll set the scene. Tens of thousands of people die waiting for an organ every year. Waiting lists are long and those in need of hearts or livers, for example, have high mortality rates. For the last 50 years, we've been trying to finesse the existing system as much as possible, but it's still ultimately reliable on either living donors for some organs or somebody's death for the others. The pandemic has been very bad news for transplants as well as everything else. Numbers of operations have plummeted, especially live donors, because COVID has, of course, made it dangerous for healthy people to go into the hospital for surgery. 
Death rates have gone up amongst people waiting for organ transplants, just some of the indirect victims of the pandemic. Now, don't forget that transplants are not just life-saving, they're life-improving. Waiting for a kidney on dialysis severely impacts quality of life. Type 1 diabetics can be cured with pancreatic transplants, freedom from insulin and pumps, corneal transplants can restore sight, and of course, Fewer donors is not necessarily something to be upset about. It means that it's a, it's a success story too. It means that we're having fewer road traffic accidents and people are living longer, but it also means that donors are older and so are their donated organs. And the main thing is, no matter how good you make transportation and the network and preservation uh, of uh, donor organs, we just don't have anywhere near enough, especially for paediatric transplants. At that talk in the Science Museum, I learned that kidneys were likely to be the first clinical xenotransplant of the modern era, and indeed kidneys have led the way throughout the history of transplant. They are A-tier organs after all. And a few months ago, um, an experimental first was performed. A pig's kidney was transplanted into a human recipient briefly. She was a brain-dead patient and had wanted to donate her organs, but unfortunately they weren't suitable, and her family felt that she'd still want to help and so consented to this procedure to test initial feasibility, and it was de de deemed a success. So it's genuinely surprising that the first proper xenotransplant in this new era was a heart rather than a kidney, but as mentioned above, this was a bit of a Hail Mary. Oh, for those of you that don't get that reference because you don't watch American sport, don't worry, you're not missing anything. All the cardiac xenotransplantation up till now has been pig hearts grafted into baboons who have been doing well and consistently surviving over a year, so that has opened the door to human trials. So why did we choose to why not an ape? who are, of course, much more closely related to us genetically, sharing a common ancestor only 10 million years ago. Well, chimps and gorillas are critically endangered or endangered, so really non-starters in terms of how many animals would be required for research and therapy. But moreover, it's that our porcine friends have got a pig list of advantages. In spite of about 80 million years separating us from an evolutionary point of view, we're already very familiar with pig biology and how to look after them. The supply of organs is effectively unlimited. There are estimated uh, 1 billion pigs in the world. Their organs are a very similar size to ours in most cases. Cardiac anatomy isn't exactly the same. The heart's orientation is slightly different within the chest, a bit straighter, so the great vessels come off at different angles. There's also a vein in the pig's heart that regresses in the womb in humans. Um, so the plumbing might be a little bit of a challenge, but it clearly ha has been done. I've not done a great deal of animal wet lab research, but I have done certain procedures on pigs, and certainly the heart and related structures are very comparable. Of course, we already use porcine tissue in cardiac surgery. Many replacement heart valves are made with pig pericardium. So this isn't the first time we've used pig products in humans. And of course, there is a brief history of humans donating organs to pigs. Um, just ask David Cameron. Xenotransplants offer so many potential benefits as well. Transplants would no longer have to be done as emergencies when a donor dies, but as planned procedures on the routine operating list, as donor organs will be available at any time. It's hard to overemphasize just what a sea change this would be. That's not just beneficial for patient and doctor's sleep patterns, but the process of brain death can damage organs. I know it's only January, but I'm putting in an early submission for understatement of the year when I say that dying is not nice. It causes a systemic inflammatory response which can directly affect the organs. Hypoxic organs rapidly deplete energy stores via anaerobic respiration. Blood pressure can shoot through the roof. And particularly for the heart, which is traditionally the last organ to be removed after the retrieval teams have taken their respective organs, Avoiding this inflammatory cascade would be very, very useful. Human organs can transfer infections. Cytomegalovirus and Epstein-Barr virus are frequently transferred, as many people have them. The reason you probably don't know if you do have them is that they rarely cause symptoms unless your immune system is weakened. And what do we do after a transplant? We give people immune suppressing medication. So we've transferred HIV, rabies, West Nile virus in uh, transplants obviously by accident, but the results are sometimes catastrophic. Pig transplants can avoid these because they are so removed from us phylogenetically. But 
I will come back to infections later because you might not know that viruses can actually hide inside DNA. When I did transplant assessments at Royal Papworth Hospital in Cambridge, patients would be referred to us from all over the country. Unfortunately, we'd have to turn down quite a few for many different reasons. Some weren't sick enough to warrant putting them through all the risks of surgery. Some were too sick or had other medical conditions that meant their risk of not surviving surgery was high. Hence, people with a better chance of survival might be prioritized to use such a valuable resource. It's one of the most challenging um, areas of transplant ethics to have to weigh up the needs of the patient in front of you versus others on the waiting list, because the resource they all require is so precious and rare. The last thing you want to do is to put a graft into someone only for it to fail within a few weeks, because then nobody else normally can benefit from it. Now, those decisions were made above my pay grade and by the transplant cardiologists who are some of the absolute best and most caring doctors I've worked with who took this process incredibly seriously and didn't, I really didn't envy being in their position. We could avoid all of this if grafts were freely available. Those edge cases could be treated. We could also extend the reach. There are about 20 million type 1 diabetics worldwide. Even if you transplanted pancreatic islets from every single deceased donor, you'd never come close to matching the demand. Now, I've never really investigated where blood goes after it leaves the heart, but apparently there are these other bits of the body, they've even got their own names and everything, and almost all of these, I'm informed, these cardiac dependents, could come from pigs soon too. Some already are being used, like corneas, and even blood transfusions could come from pigs in the near future, with the added bonus that if it isn't transfused, it won't go to waste because you can still make black pudding. So far, so good. But what are the barriers, and indeed what breakthroughs, have allowed David Bennett's transplant to go ahead more successfully than those that came before? The two I'm going to concentrate on are the immune challenges and the risk of infection. Now, when doctors are giving talks, we put up a slide at the beginning with our declarations. E.g., I declare that I'm paid by Pfizer and I'm here today to give you a totally neutral talk about medication. Or, I declare that I have shares in the product I'm about to give you a one-hour lecture about saying how amazing it is. Now, I don't receive any money from industry, so my declaration slide usually looks like this. Immunology is so freaking complicated, but suffice to say that there are multiple different ways that the body can reject a xenotransplant, more than a human allograft. If you just get a, a wild-type uh, pig heart and perfuse it with human blood, dramatic endothelial damage occurs within minutes. What's this? That is a pig's heart that was flushed with human blood in an early experiment to simulate a human transplant operation. Why is it black? It was dying. Why? The blood's immune system was rejecting it because it recognised that the heart wasn't human. Pig cells have a sugar, a carbohydrate, on their surface. You can effectively think of it like a pig blood group because our bodies recognise it as foreign and attack it the same way that somebody with blood group B attacks a graft with blood group A. The funny thing is that we already have antibodies against these sugars. They're called natural anti-pig antibodies. So how on earth did we have them? Maybe from exposure to pigs or eating pork? Well, we can test that theory out, courtesy of the Jewish and Islamic world. Even if the closest you've come to a pig is watching the Muppet Show, you have these antibodies after a few months of age because the microbes that colonize our gut in early life express the same sugars on their surface. I got an email recently telling me, um, the person saying they're not going to watch my videos anymore because they don't like the way I'm dismissive of intelligent design. And maybe they're right, because maybe this is evidence that there is a designer, a very lazy one, who clearly just reuses blocks from an entirely different build. The next problem are something called pervs. And no, I'm not talking about Prince Andrew. I mean porcine endogenous retroviruses. If you want to learn more about viruses and dead genes hiding inside your DNA, I made a video early in the channel's life, which I th uh, still quite like, so do check that out. And likewise, there are actually viruses that have worked their way into pig DNA. We know that these can cross species, and they could even then spread from the recipient to others. Ah. Infections crossing from animals to humans. Now, uh, that doesn't sound like a big deal, right? So how do you know that what you're doing won't have repercussions in 10, 20, 50 years' time? 
Some diseases that pigs can cope with might prove lethal to humans. I mean, look at BSE, look at AIDS. Here's a paper from 1998, which explains that a xenotransplant could lead to a pandemic level event. The FDA currently says that recipients of xenotransplants will have to remain under follow-up the rest of their lives and be quarantined if they start showing any signs of zoonosis. But of course, with xenotransplantation, we can modify the donor organ in advance, something we could never do with human uh, donated organs. Now, I'm condensing decades of research into a few sentences when I say this, so I really don't want the complexity to be overlooked. But essentially, a, a shopping list of modifications was put together in, for an ideal world, changes to be made to things like that sugar and other ways that the pig tissue interacts with our immune system. And over the last few decades, these changes have been achieved one by one with more and more sophisticated genetic engineering. So long, crispy bacon. Hello, CRISPR-Cas9. Teams have used the incredible gene editing technique where an enzyme cuts out a specific gene, like a pig snuffling for a truffle, to excise all 62 copies of the Perv. Luhan Yang gives a lovely TED talk of her group's work successfully achieving this and giving rise to Laika, a remarkable pervless pig. And space nerds like me will appreciate her name after the famous Soviet dog who became the first animal to orbit the Earth. What about the alternatives, you might ask? Well, artificial hearts do exist, but at present they're still a poor replacement for real organs and they cause many other complications. Stem cell therapy and promises to 3D print new organs are still way off. We really haven't seen the progress we'd hoped. Something I keep seeing on social media is the ghost heart. This claim that we're soon gonna be able to populate something called the Matrix. Matrix? No, not that one. Was the Matrix. No, not that one either. I want the Matrix! Um, Never. yeah, okay, that one. With heart cells and make a new heart. But right now, that's still science fiction. Have I bored you with all that science? Hey, I'm a dad, I'm allowed these jokes. Let's get to the ethics of xenotransplantation, which is no less interesting and will have you pork scratching your head at the implications. As aforementioned, the vast majority of people can see a much more justifiable case for using animals to save human lives rather than just for a Sunday roast. But perhaps they assume that it's simply a case of breeding some pigs the same way that a farmer might, or using pigs currently earmarked for meat. With the advent of the advanced genetic engineering that is making this DNA editing possible, things get a bit more spicy. And I'm not just talking about pork. Well, I guess I am. These arguments do apply when considering food use as well. However, unlike food-reared animals, organ donor pigs will have to be kept in sterile conditions, probably isolated on their own. Cameron, I'm afraid no one's allowed to visit the pigs. They have to be protected from outside germs, otherwise we couldn't use them for transplant. What's for bacon? No, man, I don't eat pork. What about if the donor animals were dogs? How would you feel then? We treat pigs differently through centuries of eating them in most countries, but these are arbitrary distinctions and pigs are clearly fairly intelligent. That'll do, pig. That'll do. The famous bioethicist Peter Singer talks about speciesism, akin to racism, that no one species should be regarded as superior to another. Do you agree with that? People joke about, oh, can Muslims and Jews receive pig hearts? But actually, both of those religions have got dispensations um, that the saving of a human life is paramount. And to not do that when you have the option is, is haram. I don't actually know the Jewish equivalent of haram. Teref, is that a word? I'm gonna have to edit this out, aren't I? I, I, I wasn't far off. Teref and Asur. Please uh, comment below if that is incorrect. Indeed, the Abrahamic belief is such that humans are special. The Bible says that God created man in his image, not animals. Perhaps actually the more interesting question pertains to vegans or say Jains or strict Hindus who feel the killing of an animal is wrong. If you are vegan, where do you draw the line? Killing for food, wrong. Killing for a heart transplant, maybe yes. Killing for say a cornea, I don't know, I'm, I'm not, trying to suggest anything with these, these are genuine questions. And changing the code that programs a living organism isn't as simple as right-clicking and inspecting source on a web page. Mistakes happen. 
Sometimes mutations turn out to be deleterious. Some might have unforeseen consequences. Can I just point out that the Latin name for pig is sus domesticus? The pig is sus. In Margaret Atwood's Oryx and Crake, a pharmaceutical company called Organink Farms breeds animals called pigoons. Oversized transgenic pigs genetically engineered to provide an inexhaustible supply of organs for human use, some even growing six kidneys at a time. But a byproduct of the DNA tinkering was that they had some human characteristics too, like increased intelligence. Meanwhile, they would also get eaten in the farm canteen. And in another great work of literature and social commentary, South Park, Man Bear Pig goes on a rampage. As the metaverse has recently demonstrated, dystopian sci-fi novels have actually turned out to be blueprints for human development, so it should come as no surprise that this isn't an entirely unrealistic possibility. The Chimera is a mythological beast from ancient Greece made up of part lion, part goat, part snake. And we've been able to breed chimeras for a long time now, which combine the DNA of completely different species, such as a pig engineered to grow a pancreas for a specific human patient. So this technically isn't xenotransplantation, because it'll be a human organ being transplanted, grown in what's called a bioreactor, known to you and me as a pig. The DNA coding for a pig pancreas will be knocked out, and by combining with human iPSCs, um, sorry, um, induced pluripotent stem cells, we can then make the pig grow a human pancreas instead. The great promise here is that a transplant recipient ideally won't even need to take any immunosuppression. How's it going to work? Will you be able to call up and pick a pig and grow organs to order? Once we've replaced damaged organs, will humans start trying to increase performance? There's certainly a precedent for that. Maybe an extra heart. Why not, if the supply is easy? Pluripotent stem cells can, after all, develop into any cell line, so there's a potential risk that if you're introducing human stem cells into pigs, they might develop other human characteristics on top of what we're aiming for. Now, get ready for, for some crazy stuff. Mice with human glial cells, which are support cells in the brain, were much faster at maze navigation than normal mice, and their memory was four times better. So the brain cells, the neurons, are still mousy, but the rest of the brain is human. Genetically modified pigs have also been noted to perform better when playing video games. Legislation is not keeping up with the rapid progress of technology, a pattern we see in many fields. In the UK, for example, this complex issue is boiled down to just a numerical figure. If there's more than 50% human DNA, it is subject to human legislation. But under that number, say 49%, it wouldn't, which seems a very blunt approach. Other thoughts I had when writing this include the murky world of biotech patents. Will a transgenic pig's DNA be owned by a corporation and hence yet another resource to monetize? Will we be raging about the evils of Big Pharma? What will informed consent look like for xenotransplantation? Who knows? Will this really reduce health inequality, as I've seen some people writing online where a rich person gets better access to organ donation than a poor person, as was clearly demonstrated by Steve Jobs? Or will this simply be a new therapy that further reinforces social and health disparity? Will all human clinical trials going forward be in patients like David Bennett, who had no other options? That seems like a reasonable step forward, but recall the first kidney xenotransplant that I mentioned earlier on in the video last year, um, which happened into a brain-dead woman. Is that appropriate? Um, what about children and, and pediatric transplants? So many questions. As you can probably tell, I love exploring these kinds of ethical dilemmas in medicine. And if you've watched this far, you probably do too. Without considering these, medicine can be reduced to a pure science, detached from its humanity a sow's ear instead of a silk purse. I fear that was behind some of those historical, shocking transplant decisions, as doctors have occasionally overreached their capabilities. We have to remember that, now more so than ever, because it really does feel like this is a new era. These are some of the most profound philosophical questions that we, as a species, need to ask ourselves. What do we want our future to look like? I know I'm pathologically incapable of talking to you guys about anything without making terrible jokes, but I want you to think about this with the gravity it deserves. Until next time. That's all, folks. Yesterday I went, uh, as, as we all must, 
uh, to, to Peppa Pig World. I don't know if you've been to Peppa Pig World. Who's been to Peppa Pig World? Hands up who's been to Peppa Pig World. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again. But already it was impossible to say which was which.